habari ya jioni oi more good evening out of the many languages that we do have between us tonight we have chosen english for the communication the conversation tonight so i would like to welcome you very much to this event um i'm very excited that i have with me here up on stage, Mze Abdilatif Abdallah. I know you're refusing most other titles. <laughs> and Yvonne Adiamo Award. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to have you here. I would also like to thank you, the audience, for seeing it in the same way as me, that this is an amazing opportunity to have these two about their work, about their life, their experience, and how their experience. <laughs> and how the experience of the Kenyan history is reflecting in their work. Um, I would also like to welcome those who <laughs> follow us the screen and that's actually the reason why I need a microphone. I know you would hear me very well without one but since we are live streaming the event um, as well I will actually need to take a microphone. So I hope those kind of little technical glitches will be settled in a moment. Sorry. I hope we can fix it. All right. All good things come in three. Yes. <laughs> So, um, my name is Katrin Seidel. I am the head of the Heinrich Böll Foundation's Eastern Horn of Africa office, based in Nairobi. I will be moderating, guiding us a little through tonight. Um, and now that you're looking at the three of us, you might be asking, so what's chair number four? Um, I, we have, it's not that we're missing anyone in particular, but we have put a fourth chair here. This chair is for you. It is for those questions that really cannot wait until the question and answer session, which we are going to have at the end of today. Um, it is for you and for the moments that you have been in interviews and events and you thought that this one question would really take this whole conversation in a different direction. I have to ask this. Please come, come sit with us. Um, make sure you are part of this conversation. We might even pick among you and choose someone to come and sit with us because I know that there are many of you in this audience who have engaged a long time um, with Abdullah with the work of Yvonne, with uh, Swahili Kenyan literature. Please join us. Um, before I'm doing a bit more justice to our two guests with a brief introduction, let me also say a few words about what you've just heard and what you've just seen. The music that we were playing is part of a project by Alliance Francaise. It's called Spotlight on Kenya. Um, it's been, it's a col collection of music, various music from the coast, northern Kenya, and also um, part of a project that was called Weapons of Mass Reconciliation, music that was collected and played across Kenya um, after the post violence in 2008. What you have seen, can I still be heard? Yes. <laughs> what you have seen is a project that um, it's called Who I Am, Who We Are. It's a public art project um, on the Kenyan identity. It's been inspired by the 50th anniversary of Kenya's independence. And it was trying to find artistic ways and expressions for people to express their thoughts, their ideas about identity. So there's a, a number of um, body maps were created among communities. Um, communities that came from informal settlements, that came from communities with um, um, Kenyans of Indian descent. The whole project traveled all the way from the Kisumu, from the Lake and Victoria to the coast, and Lamu had stopped over Nyeri and went up to Isiolo. And people were talking about and mapping out in these pictures their sense and their reflections on identity. We also asked almost 2,000 people in a monologue with themselves what they were thinking about being Kenyan. So we asked them several questions that they answered in that silent room. And what you saw was um, an excerpt of this project. We will be playing this again at the end 
um, of this event for those who might have missed it. Um, but let me come to my guests. Abdullah Tif Abdallah, you're one of the best known living Swahili poets. And at the same time, <laughs> possibly one of the most resilient critiques of the Kenyan government, governments. Um, a recent book about um, Abdul Latif that you can also actually um, get in the back has the very apt title, Poet in Politics. Um, Abdul Latif became the first political prisoner of independent Kenya because of his uncompromising political activism. He was sentenced to three years in solitary confinement. And um, there he created one of his most important and well-known poems that were later published under Saudi Adiki, under the name Saudi Adiki, Voice of Agony. Um, after leaving prison, Abdul Latif also left Kenya. He went to exile, taught at the University of Dar es Salaam. BBC, and for the past over, little over 20 years, he's been living in Germany, and only five years ago, um, he stopped teaching at the University of Leipzig. That's a very short introduction for a very long and rich life. Abdul Latif, can I ask you the question that we have asked almost 2,000 Kenyans in our silent room? Are you Kenyan? <coughs> I think I'm Kenyan in every sense of the word. <clears throat> um, apart from the fact that I was born there, uh, but I have been, or rather been involved, uh, or rather involved myself with uh, almost everything which is happening there, although, the, although I've been living <coughs> in exile since 1972. But every single day I make sure that at least I read what is happening there apart from the other, of course, uh, other communications which I have with uh, people either by phone or by email or otherwise. So yes, I would say that I am Kenyan. And uh, as I was telling you and Yvonne a few minutes ago there, um, I had been asked twice to take citizenship, first when, when I was living in London, after four years there, the, the laws in those days was that after living in England for four years, things have changed now, it's, it's more difficult, but you had the right to become a citizen. So you were just sent forms to apply for citizenship, and I refused, I said, no, thank you very much, I don't want it. And even here in Germany, I received a letter also from the mayor of Hamburg to ask me to, be a, to take citizenship here, I said, no, thank you. I, I don't want to be a foreigner in my own country. And although our new constitution allows dual citizenship, still, I felt, no, if I take another citizenship, I'll be diluting my Kenyan citizenship. So uh, I refused again. And uh, uh, so I think I am Kenyan, and that's what I believe. I think, therefore, I am. <laughs> I hope we're getting more than one function in microphone at some, some point in this conversation. So it's never an easy answer, the question of what makes you who you are, the question of identity, the question of identity, of belonging. I would say also very much at the core of your book, Yvonne. Um, it's uh, Yvonne's first book, um, published in 2013 under the title Dust. We're very lucky to have uh, Yvonne Adiabowo here tonight. She is presenting the German translation of her book, which was published under the title The Ort an dem die Reise endet, um, which has also inspired the title of our event tonight. Um, Yvonne says about herself that um, she has found the sense of belonging in many places, that um, hopefully also most recently in Germany, I hope, so she will be <laughs> back. Um, you were born in Nairobi, but life has taken you all over the world, all over the continents. Um, it took some time and a few professional reincarnations, um, also a short stint, um, eye-opening and disappointing in the development world. We have shared that experience. Um, before you had the courage to really talk of yourself and think of yourself as a writer, I believe. 
In 2003, Yvonne won the very prestigious Kane Prize for African Writing with her short story, Weight of Whispers. And it's the same year when you became the director of the Zanzibar International Film Festival. Um, and as I said, in 2013, your first novel was published, Dust. Another question that we asked in our silent room to many, many Kenyans, what makes you similar to other Kenyans? Or what makes you different? Uh, good evening, everybody. <laughs> Again, thank you for being here. <laughs> um, what makes us similar? Yeah. Other Kenyans. Uh, we share a landscape. Uh, uh, we share a uh, space. We share both the imagination and also the delusions. Uh, um, and uh, most of us, certainly those of us who belong to Nairobi, most of us love to share a cup of coffee at the Java Coffee House. You know. <laughs> um, we share dreams, and uh, certainly one of the other things we absolutely share is uh, the thing I believe will salvage the Kenya situation, a wicked sense of humor. Uh, I've never run across a people who can laugh at themselves so profoundly. Um, so that, that's, I think that's what we share. <laughs> let's talk about your book. Um, let's talk about both of your work. Um, your book, Dust, it really is uh, the history of a family, but it takes you very deep also into the Kenyan history. Um, it takes us to back to the colonial times, um, through the various generations of protagonists, but it also confronts us with uh, more recent events in Kenyan history, violent events that have a very profound impact on the protagonists um, in your book. For example, the bombings of the American Embassy in 1998, but also the post-election violence. Um, when, with the two of you, if, if you could say so, Abdul Latif, in some ways, um, this is history to which you are a real witness. You've been at the very beginning of a, a large part of this history, especially of um, independent Kenya. And um, in some ways, your poems, your lectures, your pamphlet, of course, your political pamphlet, of which we will be talking also later, is, is chronicling this um, history. Um, how would you say, what's, what's literature's specific approach? What is, what is the specific um, way of how writing can actually reflect on the country's, on the nation's history? Well, <coughs> try this now. Um, no, I think it's, yeah, it works. Well, <coughs> any country's or any society's literature would definitely reflect uh, uh, what is happening in that society. Um, and here we are talking now because that type of literature which deals with the society itself. Because as we know, there are different types of, of literature. Some people would write things which uh, perhaps have nothing to do directly with, with the society in which they are. In which they, are. Uh, they would perhaps come with uh, just imaginary things and, uh, which have nothing to do with their society. But uh, if we talk about the literature which deals, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a bit uh, reluctant to say that it is serious real literature, <laughs> but uh, that type of li li literature has to, has to reflect what is happening in the society. Now, there might be differences there, depending on, on the commitment of the writer, uh, or on which side the writer is. Uh, there'll be some writers perhaps who would uh, perhaps be on the side of, uh, of the few, of those who wield power, of those who perhaps benefit more from the society than the others. And then there will be others who would perhaps side with the, with the downtrodden, with the have-nots, and reflect uh, their lives. Um, with me, I, from the beginning, I, I don't know, maybe it's because I had no alternative, I had no choice. Um, I, from the beginning, decided to be on the side of, of, of the have-nots. And partly it's because of the family I was born in. 
and the family I grew in. Uh, I like to tell uh, my audience that our family is a, is a family of troublemakers uh, from long time ago. In fact, from the time of the P Portuguese uh, rule, uh, my, some members of my, of my family were in the resistance, mov resistance movement against the Portuguese. Then came the Arabs. Some of the family members were involved there against the Arabs. And then the British came. Um, my elder brother, who was the, the main person really who politicized me, my elder brother, Sheikh Abdullah Nasser, who was in that struggle against British rule. And then after independence, he passed the baton to me. And uh, he was the one, in fact, who put me into politics. In those days when I was growing up, as many young people were, I was more interested in music and Elvis Presley, Beatles and all that stuff. I didn't have a, <laughs> a knack for, <laughs> for politics. But him being a, first a nationalist and also a Muslim scholar, he was not so happy with the way I was behaving. So what he did was that he made sure that most of the time we were together. So he took me to his political meeting, to his uh, um, lectures at the mosque, when he gave lectures, Islamic lectures. So he politicized me in that way. And by also guiding me on what to read. So he's the one who gave me political books to read. One of which really took me to the extreme left was History Will Absolve Me by Fidel Castro. That book just sent me haywire. And uh, so, uh, apart, so because of that background, I just could not write anything else up except a type of literature which would be, which would, which would give voice for the, to the voiceless and which would uh, campaign or rather fight for, for the rights of those who are downtrodden and who, who don't benefit up to now uh, from what we call independence. I think that that um, demand, that expectation, that writing should also be politically critical. And as you also said, um, Abdul Latif, that uh, knowledge needs to also result in action. Um, do you do you feel this as a demand on onto you as well, Yvonne, as a younger Kenyan writer, writer of a different generation? What are the what are the demands that you that you sense in this regard? No, let's uh, actually. I'm. I'm off. Uh, I, I, let's put it this way. I, I've never met a sacred cow that I didn't want to shoot or kill or milk or something like that. But the, so, the moment, uh, the moment, uh, the moment demands or categories are are created for me, uh, that's the very moment I will seek ways to explode those particular car categories and then belong nowhere. But uh, no, I do not. I imagine I'm one of those that um, seek the idea of art for art's sake. But on the other hand, um, art is not, uh, um, it, 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 it's not a floating thing. It, it, it is embedded in the very life and soul of a people, of a landscape, of, of a society, of a happening. Um, so that, that's actually my position. But um, my own sensitization, um, particularly involving um, you know, a, a book like, uh, like Dust, uh, I'm a typical Nairobi, I was a typical Nairobi person before 2005 referendum, 2008. I absolutely needed my Java coffee and just don't bother me with too many details. Just, just make sure there, there's electricity and there's water running kind of thing. But until the moment where we almost lost, uh, lost our country, um, then suddenly the, in many ways, uh, Professor, uh, the, the, what I call the prophetic imperative of his work, Quenda Twendapi, suddenly made sense. 2005, 2007, 2008, when we detonated as a country, and certainly now. Um, but also, uh, going back to the idea of the prophetic imperative, that, uh, pa uh, that uh, uh, pamphlet, pamphlet that you produced, Prof, in 1968, anticipated the hell that would uh, uh, draw our country into an, in, into an endless vortex in 1969 with the death of Tom Boyer and everything else. You know, the death of the dream in so many ways. Um, 
which is now where the, the book, uh, you know, two thousand and five. Uh, it was a time when the country was uh, post uh, you know, uh, in, 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 where they needed a new constitution. I remember walking the streets and hearing what people were saying. What you know, just the you know people in the streets. What they were saying was completely different to what was the, the official narrative was. And I remember feeling at one moment on Mamangina Street, feeling very strongly that if the country, if our country could not speak to the ghosts, to the things of silence. Um, this is 2005, and I could hear people talking about the assassination of Tomboy as if it was just the day before. It was a sense of if we, if the country cannot find a way to address the things that it is most terrified of addressing, I was terrified we were going to explode, which we did. Um, and it is within that explosion, the, the sense of uh, the threat of the loss of country, uh, the threat of the loss of self, the questioning of what it is to be Kenyan, um, that becomes part of the exploration in uh, in that family story. This um, this kind of um, reference that you made, no, to the uh, to the um, older generation, um, in some ways, I don't know if I'm right there, Abdulatif, but I I get a bit of a sense that you are rediscovered in Kenya in some ways. Maybe it's because you've retired, you can travel more. That there's you know there's invitations. Um, people are asking um, asking also more the questions and what you just said, Ke uh, Kenya Twendapi, the pamphlet for which you ultimately actually were sentenced um, to prison, has become almost like a new actuality. It has become a new relevance. Do you get that sense that when you when you return, when you talk also to younger people, younger um, writers, that this is now, there's some sort of a generational exchange also on some level? Yeah. Um, <coughs> what, um, what is saddening, really, is that, uh, and I wish, I wish I, I was, I were wrong, really, but what is saddening is that most of these things which we thought would happen in 1960s. And it's because, first, the, 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 the regimes, which, the regimes which were there, I mean, didn't allow people to, to voice out their anger and their, uh, 70s and 80s in Kenya were very difficult years. Very difficult, difficult decades. And this is what I think. That one can say whatever what wants and nothing happens to that person, at least to, to, to a certain level, because we have seen other people who have been uh, voicing out or criticizing the government. The government have been taking the, uh, action against them. Some 30 bloggers have been arrested, I think, so far, um, and uh, things like that. Other people who have been critical of the government. Just yesterday, I was I read that the, the one of the famous cartoonists, uh, Gabo Gado, was uh, has been sacked uh, from his work because of uh, for making fun of, of the president. So it it is as if now. Those years are coming back, sneaking back quietly. And if Kenyans are not careful, well, we might not go back completely to, to those days, but uh, if we are not, if Kenyans are not careful, many of the, of the freedoms which people fought for, for all those times, are going to be snatched away from them again. And um, I can foresee I can foresee that there might be another wave of struggle again um, uh, in Kenya against these dictatorial tendencies which are creeping in back in a very subtle way. And uh, many people don't seem to either realize or don't pay attention to them. Many people are just busy trying to make ends meet, busy to to try and find out where to steal from, and uh, especially those in the government who are in the government. So um, I fear that the situation might get worse again, and uh, 
we will need another, 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 another struggle to, to. And uh, this comes back now from from the beginning when when the country got independence, uh, and that was that's why Kenya of Trinapi came in. I think the mistake which was done there was again we gained we gained our independence, but there wasn't enough time, or rather those who were in power didn't allow people to sit to solidify that independence. When we got our independence, which was sort of half-backed independence, so it needed time for people to, to really work on that in order to have, really, to have real independence. But to those who are in power, of course, really, and most of them also took for amassing wealth. That was the main purpose. In fact, those who were those who, most of those who are in the leadership, the majority of them, I mean, their, 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 their idea was to get rich quick. Uh, and that's why when people started to question things and reminding them that this is not what we fought for, people didn't go into the forest and fought the, the, the British People lost their lives. It was not for amassing wealth, but to, to, to distribute that wealth. Um, the, the men. That was the main thing. Freedom and land. Even the, the so called my mom, the, 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 the formal name was Freedom and Land Army. That, those were the two things which were people are fighting for. Now, let's, if we look at. What, what, what happened in, after independence is that the very thing which people fought for, the land, which was, of course, appropriated by the, by the settlers, the white settlers there, after independence, Kenya, the first loan which Kenya got was to get a loan from the British government to buy back that land, which was stolen from the people. Now, after it, after it was bought back, people are again expected that at least that land will be given back to those who are robbed of. But what happened was that it was those who were in power and who had the money and bought that land again. Now, at the moment, in fact, the two thirds of the land in Kenya is owned by 20% of the people. And most of those people are former presidents. Started with Kenyatta, then came Moi, and Moi Kibaki as well. In fact, these are the three wealthiest land owners in Kenya. They use their position to, again, to rob the people of that land again. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, and this is what I tell when I'm, nowadays I like to talk to young people more when I'm in Kenya. To try to, and, and, and again, the sad thing again here is that many of them don't even know their history. They don't know what happened in the past, as I said earlier. They just think Kenya has been as it is now, 20 years since they were born. They don't know. You talk to people, and some of them, and this is what's really sudden, some of them are university graduates, and they know nothing about what happened. And this is a deliberate policy of the Kenyan government to, to make people forget about what happened in the past so that they should not continue to, with the, with the struggle of why people fought for independence. So, yeah, <laughs> in short. <laughs> I think this, this, this missing process of um, dealing you know, with, with the past, um, also with the colonial past, um, I think Ngugi Basiongo called it the history of amnesia that's, that's kind of um, you know, ruling uh, Kenya. Um, you know, that's I very- I would say it's amnesia aside, but it's, it's a del deliberate policy of the government, mm. not to, and not to teach, yeah. because history is no longer now a, it's no longer compulsory. a compulsory subject you now. So this is very, I mean, this is very much what drives you in your work as well, Yvonne, I guess, no? to write against that, um, that erasure, that forgetting, to, um, to actually present or um, have a complement the history and also the, no, the deliberately um, wrong narratives about the history in the book that you've been writing. Um, is it, um, I mean, one of the themes that um, Abdul Latif is just talking about, the question of um, the independence, the promise of independence, and how it hasn't come to fr fruition, how people are still waiting for it. 
Um, do you do you do you have that sense? Do you feel that we have a broken promise there? Is it and who might have been who might have been responsible for it? Gosh, that makes uh, I, I, actually I, w I wish I had that serious intent for quite frankly. It's probably an angst ridden searching for um, uh, what does it mean for me and for my generation to be Kenya. For the simple reason that uh, I, I know uh, some of the older writers accuse us of navel gazing, which we, which is true, <laughs> uh, we are. Um, for us, the oppressor is not necessarily the the place of disillusion, and, and we've also also been, our generation has also been described as the disillusion post uh, <laughs> post colonials. But simply because the idea of the oppressor, the demon, the terror, is not the um, uh, the archetypal colonial person. It's not the British. Uh, that is our challenge, our problem, and the very thing that we need to look at. The people that have wounded our dreams are very much our parents. Okay, um, these are the 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 these are the people people we know, people who look like us, people who made big promises to us. Um, the oppressor, the people who have uh, cracked and betrayed the Kenyan ideal are our own people. So the, the part of the angst, the anguish, um, but also the interrogation is what does that mean? How are you going to, how does our generation or, or our children then say that actually um, the thief, the murderer, the assassin is my daddy, is my mummy? The, th uh, the plunderer of the Kenyan national, e uh, national economy is my uncle. Um, does that may then mean that we create excuses for them? Uh, do we then develop narratives to justify this? Because it is even more painful to acknowledge the fact that the, the face of horror in the mirror is our own. It's more, far more painful, and I know certainly uh, being here in German society, I think that's also part of the journey that, uh, as a society, you've also you're also constantly undertaking. So no, um, I, I think for me, and I think for a lot of my peers, it's a it's a time of constant questioning and understanding. What does Project Kenya actually mean? Does Project Kenya actually still exist? The great historian. Um, um, Ogot, who was very much part of the conceptualizing of Kenya um, yeah, um, before independence and just after independence, has said, I think a couple of years ago, said, Project Kenya is dead. Uh, yeah. Before we talk maybe a little bit more about um, continuation and um, how, how what this kind of, you know, um, um, process of, of, of closure, of forgiveness, maybe account, no, searching, looking for accountability, this dialogue could look like. Um, could I ask you, Amtilati Abdallah, to give us a bit of a feel and the sense of um, you know, what you particularly called the difficult in the years of the 70s um, and the 80s, um, and maybe you do us the pleasure of read one of your poems that are actually asking about that process of um, how could there be as you formulated, how could there be peace between us? Um, yes, please. Yes, I would. I would. Yes, I would like you to to read one of the books. Um, maybe as um, as you are looking for it. What is also interesting is that um, you both have chosen a different language in which you are in which you are publishing, in which you work, and expressing yourself. Um, that also means, of course, that you um, possibly can be read and understood by different different people. So you might actually also, you know, my question would be, what is the audience in some ways you know, for, your, for your writing, even when you're publishing in English, um, you're, you're publishing in Kimvita, um, Swahili, you know, a very specific dialect of Swahili even. What does that, what does that also transport? What does that also mean to be writing in, so, in that different languages? Well, <clears throat> Again, with me writing in Kiswahili <laughs> was was not a, a choice. In fact, I, I, I like to tell people that 
I didn't choose Kiswahili, Kiswahili chose me. <laughs> uh, again, uh, <clears throat> again, th that depended on the environment I was in. Again, family environment once again. Uh, because apart being a, f a family of troublemakers, especially for those who are in power, uh, it's also a family of artists. Uh, in the family we have painters, we have uh, singers and poets as well. And uh, two of the people who, who influenced me a lot, uh, uh, my poetry was my, uh, my, 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 my great uncle who brought me up from the age of three till, till when he died in 1962. He himself was a poet. He was a teacher, he was a school teacher, he was a Quran reciter, and also a poet. And he had a weekly program of the then Saudi Amvita, which was the voice of Mombasa, uh, where he, he, he recited his poems weekly. And what happened was that before, after, 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 write, after composing his poems, before going to recite them at the, record them at the radio station, he used to give me to read them. So that's how I was introduced to poetry, in fact, by him. By him reading, letting me to read his poems before he went. And then my elder brother, my other elder brother, who is a, who is a major Swahili poet, Ahmed Nasir. Again, he was another influence. And both of them was wrote in Kiswahili. And also the, the environment I grew up in, um, it was a Swahili, a Swahili environment. Uh, English was only spoken at school. I didn't come, I didn't encounter anywhere, and I encountered it anywhere else except at school. So language, has, uh, Kiswahili has been my, uh, my mother tongue and also my environment tongue, if I could say that. So, and uh, I ended up writing in Kiswahili. In fact, uh, in all my writing career, I've written only four poems in English, one of which you had asked me to, to, to read tonight. But the rest is uh, in Kiswahili. And, um, and mainly it's because uh, that is the language in which I'm comfortable in, in which I, can, I have uh, confidence in. Uh, with the English, I have to look for words, <laughs> not with Kiswahili. They come, they just uh, flow. Um, and uh, especially in my writing in Kimvita, in my, demo, my dialect of Mombasa, uh, this dialect nowadays, because of the, of the influx of people from other parts of Kenya, in fact, this dialect is dying out now. Uh, not, even, not even young people who are Swahilis themselves, who are born in Mombasa, with both parents from Mombasa, many of them. Nowadays, if you listen to what they speak, it's not the Kiswahili I knew. <laughs> uh, so now, by again, by writing in this dialect of mine, again, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a language which, uh, especially when it comes to poetry, it's, 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 it's not at par with standard Kiswahili. Standard Kiswahili lacks so many things. I've been, I taught it, but. I always taught my, told my students, if I had a, a free will, I wouldn't have taught you this. <laughs> Especially when it comes to poetry, it restricts you a lot. With, whereas with Kimvita, all these different sounds which, uh, which, are not, which you cannot find in standard Kiswahili. Um, in Kimvita, for example, we have four different types of T, letter T, how to pronounce it. Four different ways. Letter D, we have about three, two different ways of pronouncing it, and other and many other letters. Now, this, since poetry is about, is not only about words, but it's also about sounds. Poetry is not only word, but sounds. That's what makes poetry poetry. <laughs> so, uh, and I couldn't find any better <laughs> uh, language or dialect except my uh, my own mother dialect. Yeah. How about you, Yvonne? <laughs> I was just about to write, poetry is about sound. <laughs> uh, 
Um, uh, well, I grew up. My, I, when I when I entered the world, I entered the world in uh, three languages: Kiswahili, a little bit of Kiswahili, or what uh, lightheartedly I'd call Oswahili, Hello <laughs> Kiswahili. Um, uh, mostly English, we're an English-speaking household, but a Kenya English-speaking household and Luo. Um, but uh, we navigated our world and each other mostly through English. So I lay claim, full claim to English, um, and I lay claim to the English um, of, of my landscape. Um, the way I describe a zebra is not necessarily the way a Londoner will ever describe a zebra. Um, so, I make no apology to my love, actually, passion for the language, uh, both English. But I, I love all, all forms of language. But I'm, I encountered the, what I call the, my prophets, uh, Tolkien, Austin, Chesterton, even Aikweyama, um, Achebe, uh, through the medium, the environment, the world of English. And uh, that's where I play, <laughs> in my own way. <laughs> Well, so let's hear um, a poem by you in the inferior language of English, I suppose, but um, for us to understand. Thank you. Um, also, I think I have to give you the background of this poem. As I said earlier, 70s and 80s were the most difficult decades in Kenya. When the depression... Oh, sorry. Sorry, forgotten about it. Sorry. Yeah. It was in, during the, those two decades that repression was intensified in Kenya. But at the same time, thankfully, people didn't just accept it. People resisted it uh, in various forms. Uh, one of them was for, through underground activities. Um, in the 1980s, I moved to London in 1979, so in the 1980s, I was in London. And in 1982, there was a coup attempt, a military coup attempt in Kenya, which thankfully did not succeed. Although the, those who were in power, of course, we didn't like them, but we didn't, uh, at least those of us who are active in uh, political activities, we didn't want to have a military government there, because we had already seen what military governments have done in Africa, uh, especially in West Africa. So thankfully it didn't succeed. But the, the reaction of the government against that coup was unbelievable. So many people were killed, especially those who are the government either imagined or thought that they were against the government. So many people were arrested. So many people just disappeared. Up to now, we don't know where they are. They must have been killed. Now, <clears throat> as I said, I was already in London those days. Ngugi Wadiongo had come to London to launch his new book there when the coup attempt happened. So a message was sent to him that he should not go back home because they were waiting for him. Many of the university lecturers who were on the left side of politics were arrested. Some had to flee the country. Had, uh, some were uh, killed as well. So he was warned not to go back. So he was stranded in London. I remember at that time we were only about five of us got together, five of Kenyans. And we said we cannot just sit idly by here in relative freedom and do nothing. Uh, we have to do something about it. So we started first with the Committee for the Release of Political Prisoners in Kenya, which, was, which we formed in July 19, uh, so, sorry, in, in, in August 1982. Uh, we worked with that committee for five years, fighting for those who were arrested. But then later on, we thought that we must have a political movement because that was a human rights committee. Now, we formed a political movement, United uh, Movement for Democracy in Kenya. Now, when we were, we were doing our activities in London, 
the government sent me sent to me a messenger to come and talk to me to tell me not to continue with the struggle which we were waging then and again there they used the tribal card because the majority of those whom I was working with were from the Kikuyu community. And then they came with this, that uh, why, why, why do you get involved with these people? I mean, they are against this government because it's not a Kikuyu who is leading it. So we would advise you not to get involved with this. And in fact, the government would be happy to let you come back home because by then I, I lived, I stayed, I lived in exile for 22 years without being able to go back home. So they said, if you, if you disassociate yourself with them, the government will allow you, will allow you back and, uh, and also will be, the government will be ready to give you whatever you say you want to give. Uh, so it was one way of bribing me. So I told that messenger, go back to the government and he said that he was sent by the president himself go back and tell him that I'm not interested in that offer. I did not, since when I was a youth, I didn't get in, myself involved in political activities for any material gain. I believe that things were wrong in my country. I believe that I have to do something to make things right. So, and then they sent another person second time. And this time they sent somebody who was, who was, a relative of mine, <laughs> again to talk to me about the same thing. I sent this person back again the same way. Now this poem, therefore, was, a, was a, as, as if it was a response to that offer. I'm talking to the president here, President Moi. Um, Moi came with his, his very funny philosophy. It's called Nyayo philosophy, meaning footsteps. Uh, he, he meant that he was following Jomo Kenyatta's foot, foot, footsteps, and he really followed them. In fact, he, he became uh, an expert in that because the atrocities he committed were more than what Kenyatta did. So, and he called that philosophy peace, love, and unity. So this poem is called Peace, Love, and Unity, for whom? So I'm talking to now, at the end of the poem, I'm finishing the poem with, the, with those who are familiar with the Quran, with the first 11 verses of chapter 81 from the Quran, which talks about the judgment day. So when you hear me in the last, last line saying when, starting each line with when, 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 those are verses from the Quran. It's talking about judgment day, you know? Meaning here that there will come a time, there will come a judgment day Kenyans will judge those who committed all those atrocities. Unfortunately, up to now, nothing has happened uh, because of the impunity which we have there. Anyway, right. So, and so you come and talk to me about peace, love, and unity, expecting me to agree, parroting your parody in my poetry, decorating your tyranny with bouquets of perfumed words and imagery to drive away the stench of your treachery and hoodwink humanity. I refuse. I refuse to enter my brain and ask it to entertain even the sound of the idea that our loves should be one. Because what by love you define doesn't tally with mine. I love my heroes. You ignore, persecute, and kill. You love my enemies who rob and enslave me still. How then can there be love between you and me when the beats of our heart's music are not in harmony, when our hearts pump in and out different colors of blood? No, I refuse. I refuse to sing your song of submission and despair. I will instead forge my own words, which will cry out for my martyred heroes, past and present, whose blood and tears and death and soil and toil gave life to the tree of the freedom of my soil. Those who always sought for freedom of speech and thought and refused 
to bend or be bought. Those whose faith never went to call for freedom to each and all. Whose courage was their shield and with their spear of truth they fought and killed. Those who with their lives they saw that come what may, onward they will go till their humanity they restore. Every day, every minute, I hear the bones and blood of my heroes declare there is a debt to square. Them we have not forgotten. Them we will always honor and mention. With their memories, we shall rekindle the fire, spreading its flames of wrath and ire to burn the roots of our oppression and uncover your every evil intention. How then can there be peace between us? How can there be peace between us when I'll never accept to bury the people's anger in the tomb of my verse? How can I forget decades and decades of my people's suffering and pain, of tears and blood pouring from their struggling limbs like rain? How can I ask them to sing your songs in high volume, to stifle the tormented sounds of those you torture and maim? How can I draw veils over their eyes to conceal and eclipse the scenes of numerous massacres? I can still hear the echo of those dead proclaiming our country, our wounded, mutilated country, where the dead are not dead and the living are not living, our country sculpted in fire and blood, where the north is barren and the south is hard, our country in death, we still bleed for you because we have decided to fear death less and decided to love death more. Because if by living we are dying, why then not die a little more so that we can live longer? Should I ignore these voices of these noble daughters and sons of my land? No, I refuse. For it is their unity I crave for. Shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm we go, not with you, whom we happen to know that you take from a lamb and give to a lion more. You, who have torn our house in two, ignoring the majority and favoring the few. But when the sun is darkened, when the stars fall and disperse, when the mountains are made to move away, when the camels 10 months pregnant are left untended, when the wild beasts are brought together, when the seas are set alight, when the souls are paired like with like, when the infant girl buried alive has asked, for what crime was she slain? When the records are laid open and the sky is stripped bare and there's nowhere to hide, you who today judges shall be the accused. Thank you so much, Abdelatif Abdallah. Well, how can there be peace? Yvonne. <laughs> We've been, you've already been both alluding to it. Um, you know, when the political pamphlet for which you were um, imprisoned asked the question, Kenya, where are we headed? And it seems 2016, asking question again becomes dangerous. Is this, is this where, where, Kenya, where are we headed in 2016? And can there be peace? Of course there can. Uh, we've known seasons of great peace. I was there in 2002. I was one of the millions at Uhuru Park. Uh, when Kibaki was being made president. I remember my hand, uh, there was no, absolutely, this, it was, you know, there was absolutely no space. My manager uh, next to somebody, ordinary Kenyans around a tree, and uh, carrying my handbag, these guys took, took my handbag and told me, you know, go up the tree, we'll, we'll look after your handbag. And it was all fine, and, it, and we were an amazing people then. Uh, there was a, uh, there's never been a moment, I, I will never forget that moment of immense possibility. Uh, we were beautiful, we were one, we were an immense people. 
uh, we were peaceful. More, but more than peace, if you can imagine a tight, tightly packed space, a million people at least, and it was just euphoria and laughter and strength. And like I say, those double rainbows, literally, it's, it's as if the whole world, the whole universe had descended um, to live among us, to be among us in celebration. Um, so, um, I, I'm, it's, it's not, I, I'm not, I'm not saying this because of the, nost not about nostalgia, it's about the, the truth, the realization, and part of my own drive, part of the thing driving me is the knowledge that we have been there. We know what that looks like. We know how amazing, how, what amazing smells and tastes and feels like. Uh, we know what unity is. We know what love, uh, you know, we know how, we have known love, I've known love, belonging and being. Um, and that, in that year, we were the, I think there was a poll taken all over the world, and we were the most, Kenya was the most optimistic nation in the whole world. Yes. Has, has that changed in the last polls? It has, yes, it has since changed. So it's the knowledge of having been there. Um, and so fine, we are now trying to redefine, we're trying to find out who we are. Uh, we tried many things, the constitution, the devolution, I hope this were, these were going to be the templates for peace. You ask me, can peace be possible? I, I say, of course it can. I don't think we have a choice, number one. Um, how we'll get there, I don't know. Uh, it may require struggle. Um, but uh, it will also require honesty, and that, and that includes personal honesty before we look at society, before we look at the president or the leadership. Um, in me, there is a tribalist. In me, there is a, a thief. In me, there is, I have a prize. Uh, if somebody would offer me $2 billion, I think that's the current going rate, um, to rob a bank in Kenya, I might take it. So I need to make peace. With, I need to find a way to exercise my particular brand of demon. But it's not just me, but it's the entire population. Can we do that? I don't know. But we need to be able to do that. We need to face up to our particular brand of bullshit and uh, lay it aside. It's not to look at anybody else. I think the struggle, and I think it's the same struggle I believe your society and Europe is having. Just as an aside, I am appalled by the discombobulation, that's the word, of Europe around the refugee, the so-called refugee situation, which you're calling a crisis. It's not. But it's about looking within. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's about this human struggle and a human fear about looking within. Can we do it as Kenya? I, I hope so. We have too beautiful a country to lose. Yes, yes, of course. Um, as uh, Yvonne was saying, um, the 2002, after the elections, there, Kenyans were full of hope that things now are going to change. And uh, again, of course, we know what happened. The, again, the struggle was once again betrayed. The independence was betrayed by those who were in power. And again, those who took up power after this so-called second liberation, again, betrayed the people once more. I was one of those few people who are not very optimistic. I didn't expect that things will change with these people. Because when you looked around, it was the same group of people. It was only Mohi who was missing. <laughs> the president, who, the one who became the president was the vice president of Moi, Mai Kibaki. And all those who are around, I'm not around him, are the same group of people who have been, some of whom have been since Jomo Kenyatta's time, and then came Moi, and then, so you cannot expect that these people will behave differently. First, they were not in the opposition party which, or the opposition coalition which won the, the elections out of conviction, no. Most of them, in fact, joined the opposition parties at the last minute when they saw the writing on the wall that Khan was going to lose the elections. So in order to, to, to retain their positions of power, they just jumped the boat and joined the opposition parties and ended up in government once, once again. So 
I remember I even wrote a poem about that. Now, when I was being interviewed in the radios and with some Kenyans who heard about me saying that, no, nothing is going to change, they, some, of, some of my friends said, well, come on, Abdelatif, now you're just, you just used to being in the opposition. <laughs> but I said, no, I, it's, it's, I'm just being realistic. I cannot expect these people to, to bring about changes, no. And especially with our political, so-called political parties, I always say that we don't have political parties in Kenya. We don't. It's just a groupings of people who come together, especially when there's an election around, in order to contest the elections. And then, but how can you have a party without without ideology? It's absurd. Anyway, so I didn't expect anything. Now another point here, which I wanted to make, was that, and this is the things which Kenyans have to learn. They should stop. They should stop pinning their hopes on these politicians which we have in Kenya. Nothing will change with them. People have to try and devise other ways. They have to form their own parties which will fight for their own interests instead of joining these, these clowns and, uh, and in, in their parties. So, and here, this is another thing which I always say. You know, when we got independence, the first years of independence, we all we, we blamed everything on the colonialists, colonialism. Me, I was one of them too. But and then after a while, I stopped because we had we have we we, 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 we we the governments have been in in our hands for quite some time. We should have changed whatever was bad, which which was, which was brought by colonialists. We didn't, so it's. We should blame ourselves. And this time also, this is what I, in fact, when I was in Nairobi in December, I was saying the Kenyans should stop blaming the politicians for the, for the situation in which it is in the country. Because it's you, the people, who elect these people and put them in power. I mean, they have they, 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 they betrayed you all this time, and yet you keep on voting them back. And then you complain. I mean, you shouldn't complain. They are just behaving the way they know. You are the ones who put them there. So it's upon Kenyans to, to find other ways of, of, of bringing about these changes. Um, and, and, and one of which would be perhaps to start real political parties, vanguard parties, which will, and it's a difficult, it's, it's, it's a hard job. And we should not expect that things will change in 10, 20, 30 years' time. But there have to be these struggles. As they say, it's, a, it's, it's not an, an event, but a process. Many of those who later on became independent or won their liberation, it took them years, decades, before they got where they got, uh, including our fight for independence of our country. It took decades, more than 60 years before we got independence. So Kenyans have to organize themselves in a different way to, in order to bring about these changes. We will be hearing from Dust at the end of, um, of the conversation. We'll, I'm going to ask Yvonne to read. But um, nobody has taken up my offer to come and sit with us so far. Um, but I want you to please take up my offer now and ask some questions. So I would like to open this conversation to the floor. Who is, who is going to start? I'm sure there's lots of questions here. Please. Do we have a roving mic? They have a, there's a question here. <coughs> Um, no, I'm good. I, I want to sit here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for reading your poetry. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for coming. Um, I'm Kenyan, so uh, if I was sitting in that box, I'd have a couple of things to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it short. I'm not really sure if it's a question. Um, after the last election, um, there was such a sense of loss, and it was hard to even... Um, not defriend people on Facebook, so I made it, made it through without defending anyone on Facebook. 
And what I'm trying to say is, is uh, the sense of disappointment and loss um, is unequally divided, obviously. So there's people who are invested and who are also disappointed, but they can cope. They have a way of coping. And so after um, I grew up in Kenya, went to school in Kenya and, and went to boarding school and national boarding school. So people were from all over the country were there, obviously. So it's these people whom I'm, I'm friends with on Facebook. And I feel like we, um, uh, you t t both touched on very much on the have uh, people who don't have and who are not uh, uh, profiting from independence. 50 years of indep Kenyan independence was more bitter than sweet to me, basically. So I understand. So it's more I'm concerned with everyday people. I know that we do have privilege in some in some areas, but I'm concerned with what how we the text the social texture. How do we try again after so much disappointment? So I guess it is a question. I'm, I'm, what I'd, I'd like to ask is this. Um, we lose hope. I'm, I'm hopeful every time, and every time it's a deep fall. And then just the, to try again. That's what Facebook was was basically. What what is for social media is 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 it's this sense of um, we're trying to not fall apart. We're trying to at least what we have is we have each other's everyday people, and we're trying not to fall apart. How do we move ahead? Because that's kind of we're frozen in time, and I'm glad that it hasn't fallen apart. But how are we moving ahead? That's that's the other thing across all this disappointment and the rifts that are there, obviously, and and the different investments that we basically have looking at the speech communities and everything obviously i'm a luo my my, my parents are luo and luya so we are kind of like the more the dispossessed uh, uh, groups who are we have been waiting 50 years for some kind of political representation and it's not really happening in that's in that scale so there's yeah how, how are we moving forward and not just holding together <laughs> That's so mean, man. <laughs> the struggle isn't over. <laughs> Y'all haven't finished. <laughs> I don't know. I'm 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 part of the face. I've got my Facebook support group, <laughs> and I've got my morning team. The you know that kind of thing. And like you, I'm, there's a part of my heart. I was I was far away, but I remember how heartbroken not only I was, but the family that was there said you know for for three months there was this uncanny silence on the streets of Nairobi. Um, and Kisumu was in complete distress for three months. But then the, on the other hand, you had the gloaters and then the expression of Utadu, <laughs> what you gonna do about this? I'll suck it up, moving on. Or, uh, and, that, and that phrase, accept and move on. But the thing is that none of us, no one, not even the gloaters are moving on. And we are all, and that's, and that's place of stasis you feel, we're all in it. I don't know, I don't have an answer. And I keep wondering if, uh, and you're right when you said it was a sense of loss. It was a sense of, I remember coming back um, after six months, I'd been away for two years, I come back, and at that time the airport had just burnt. I remember feeling as if I'd walked it. You guys know the Salvador Dali memory of time, where the, <laughs> Literally, that thing of what, where is my country? I felt like I was walking into the landscape of memories of time and everything was kind of drippy and, and strange. The surreal feeling has not disappeared yet. Um, but uh, be, being Kenyan, the kind of, uh, we've kind of redefined the notion of the stiff upper lip, everything is fine. And even if your petticoats are frayed and your bums are exposed, we are fine. But we are not. I don't know. Maybe the answer may be a very simple thing. Maybe it's the need for the conversations we need to have. We need, and, and it's very, very. I don't know why it's particular. Maybe, you, maybe Malim, you can tell us why is it so difficult to talk about, uh, just to speak, just to speak as Kenyans, and uh, maybe to uh, to lay out the ghosts. We have never mourned, for example, uh, Tom Boyer's passing. No one, the country hasn't. Can we? come together and grieve? I don't know. I don't have an answer. But they are, I know the things that I need. I know I need to cry. 
n not as Yvonne, I need to cry as a Kenyan, and I don't want to cry alone. I, I know I need to mourn and grieve over something and to key, to, to wail, not just to cry, not, so, not polite tears, I need to weep. And maybe after that, something will heal. Yeah, I don't know. Well, yeah, me too, I'm one of those people who, who don't lose hope. Uh, because losing hope is just another type of death. You lose hope, you, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't deserve to be, to be on the, in this world. What are you doing then? <laughs> anyway, I, I hope, me too, I hope that uh, things will ultimately change in Kenya. But, um, and I pin my hopes on young people because young people are the ones who are really were the engine of change. Uh, any young person who is not interested, I tell young people, any young person who is not interested in change, something must be wrong with that person. He must better go and see his or her doctor. Because youth is about change, bringing about change. Many of us, me, I started when I was 19 years old to be active. I went to prison when I was 22 years old. So I pin my hopes on the, on the youth. But the youth need to have examples or mentors. Me, myself, I was, apart from this elder brother of mine, when I looked around Kenya, especially during the independence struggle, there were many people there whom I associate myself with and who were my heroes. One of them was Jomo Kenyatta himself. He was my hero. It's only when, when he started misbehaving that I started to oppose him. Jeremogi Oginga Odinga was another one. In fact, he was, he, was, he was my leader because I joined the Kenya People's Union when I was 19 and I was actually living on. So, Kagia and the others. That's within the country. Outside the country, there were other people who influenced me politically as well. The Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, Michael Max, and all those troublemakers. Yeah? <laughs> so youth need mentors. Unfortunately, at the moment, apart from very few Kenyans who are in the limelight, who are political leadership, most of them, one cannot be inspired by them. Therefore, the youth do not have a concrete example to follow there. Now, but still, that should not be an excuse, really. Because, uh, and again, this is what I tell people, the young people whenever I'm in Kenya, is that, that they should start by having groups, just discussion groups. This is how we started. When we saw things were not going the right way, first we just met and discussed what was happening in the country. Action came later, after discussion and after understanding the problems, and then we tried to find out what should we do in order to bring about these changes. So it should start with that, discussion groups. And as I said earlier, also to Kenyans have to think about forming a political party, a real political party, which with, with ideology and with, uh, with concrete policies. Um, then the rest, I think, will come through that. Um, after those, in those discussions, uh, people will come up with, uh, with, 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 with solutions or what should be done in order to, to advance uh, uh, the cause. Um, Unfortunately now, <laughs> I don't know, when I compared some of the youth, which uh, the present youth and, and, and ourselves then, I don't know where maybe it was because we experienced colonialism, some of us, therefore we still had that anger in us that, uh, no, this is what we were fighting against and these people are continuing with the same practices. So we experienced the, 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 the evil of colonialism, we didn't want it to continue. Whereas with the 
youth in the present time, they didn't go through that. As I said, many of them came, grew, were born and grew up in, in this relative freedom and uh, in quotes, prosperity. So some of them don't see the reason why sh they should rock their boats. As I said, as, uh, Yvonne said earlier, her interest earlier was to see that there was water running in the house, there was electricity, gets her, Java. and, and Java, and Java was having, <laughs> what else do you want? <laughs> the rest, you left it to, to politicians, <laughs> right? And this, as I said, politics is too important to be left to politicians alone. People have to be involved. Politicians, we know them all over. They are the same. They are the same. No? And uh, so I hope, my hope is that, yes, um, something will come out of this. But people have to be reminded, you, especially the youth, again and again and again and again. And then something will tick one day. I'm hopeful of that. This could indeed be a perfect closing words, but I am going to take a few more questions from the gentleman um, in the back. Maybe I'll collect like two or three questions. So one, two, three. Thank you. Thank you very much for the pop. Nothing wrong with If, if you would like to, you could also introduce yourself, maybe. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Okay. I just speak it out. Yeah, exactly. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is uh, George Mangan. I live in Berlin for quite a number of years, close to 20 years. Um, we are here in Berlin, and we try to do as much that awareness to the community and to the people in the UK. Uh, as the Chancellor of Nairobi, I see board is very complex, very formed, and it comes from a board that uh, not maybe they were as critical, but as you as a young woman in this specific thing, I don't know what you can do about it. It's, uh, it shows
thank you. Thank you very much for this, for this comment. I think I'll take a couple more questions. Um, the, the gentleman here to the right. Let's try with microphone. If you okay. Thank you, Mr. Abdallah. My English is not really good, but I try. <laughs> you said that uh, we are, we are um, uh, <clears throat> it is our fault that we vote the people which they are standing now. The thing is that if we don't vote, who's going to standing and rule us? Because if it's going to be a military rules, it will be the worse than now. So I hope our country will be at peace and to be the right person. And not always the same family of Udinga and the same family of Kenyatta. My name is Abdulaziz Kasim from Lamu. Thank you. I think there was another. I, I, can I take one more? Yes, I think so. Um, <coughs> yes, I have to send you around the room to the back again. There's a lady in the back. Yes. Um, hello, my name is Bonis. I'm Kenyan. Um, I, will, I just want to pick up from what you mentioned, Mr. Abdallah. You were saying that it's up to the youth to meet and have groups and have discussions. I don't know how involved you are with the social media, I'm sure Yvonne is, but I think the last four years has shown that a lot of people are, are meeting and are talking. I mean, it's not like the Bunge it's, it's just another form which they're doing on social media. And I think now if you look at Facebook and Twitter, you'll see a lot of Kenyans are angry. There's almost nothing that um, the president can say without people literally insulting him and, and you know, bringing him to book and questioning him what he's doing. And a lot of people, as I said, are, I mean, I think a lot of people are connected and a lot of young people are connected and are talking. Uh, journalist, the nation media journalist, uh, John Girachu was, was arrested because he highlighted something that happened in parliament. And within one day, there was an uproar and he was out, which you would think is a good thing to have these people who are always watching government and saying, no, we saw that, we saw what you did, and we want you to do uh, something about it. But my question is, are they doing it responsibly? And, and as you say, how, how can this be advanced into something more? Because I don't think many of them are willing to make political parties, but what else is an option for this? I believe none of these are very easy. Um questions to answer, but um, Yvonne, do you want to give it a go? What's, what's political alternatives, who can we vote for, and also the question of organizing among the youth? Okay, okay. oh, Wanjala, right? Um, when I said I don't know, what I'm trying to say, what I'm actually trying to emphasize is the fact that, oh, we need new ways, we need new answers, we need a new vocabulary, we need a new language for what is happening in our country. Grassroots, we've done that. Computers, we've done that. Organizing people, all the way from Turkana down to a place called Wothogi, done that too. But it's brought us into the same situation where we have, and we, some of us have been doing this for over 20 years. And we have, I think one of the things we do need to come to a point of realization as a country, and as somebody who has been active, politically active in very quiet ways and literary and creative ways as well, not just in Nairobi, throughout Kenya, is simply this. We've come to a place of stasis. The old ways do not work. And I remember when people, when people gathered to lament uh, the failure of 2013, and these were you know, major activists, we gathered around Inuka Trust, uh, run by John Givongo. And I remember what one of our great uh, technologists said, you are outplanned, you are outstrategized, you are outperformed. For the last couple of years, the NGO sector has been in a total crisis of identity and of strategy. And I've been one of the most critical people, saying that you cannot use 1960 strategies on a, on a 21st century political machine. You cannot. 
Not when these guys hire multi-billion dollar uh, UK-based perception management organizations. <laughs> However many computers you contribute to the grassroots, I promise you this, it is not going to make a difference. It's not, not because, because, no, 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 listen to me. I'm saying this because, no, no, sit, listen to me. <laughs> What I'm telling you is this, you have got a highly mob, a, 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 a people who are, have got 3G communication systems. People have moved mobile. Internet is being streamed on the phone right now. That is actually where a lot of action is taking place, right down in the grassroots, including uh, among my friends in Turkana. So what I'm trying to tell you, and, and this is the challenge, and I think that's the challenge also Professor has put. We need from you, young people, new questions. We need from you a new form of vocabulary, a new imagination. The old imagination does not work. We need another language from you. The challenge is that that's a harder story, and that is the greater challenge. And when I say I don't know, it's coming, it's coming from a place of saying the old answers do not work, no longer work, and I don't know who is going to. It's such a struggle to imagine a new way. And I'm putting that out as a challenge. Second thing, uh, the vote, yes, you're right. We need to vote. Um, and then the, the fear is who do you vote for? I think it's, it's between, it's a, it's a similar situation. If, if, if Trump is running in the United States and Hillary Clinton, who do you vote for? I don't know. Again, it's one of those things. Social media, absolutely, yes. Some amazing stuff on the, on, on the internet. Um, and, and you asked, how do you do it responsibly? I, I, for, quite frankly, and when I, I'm, I'll say it again, I don't know. That becomes the challenge. Looking forward to a new imagination. Maybe 2017 will um, emerge with an in, incredible new vocabulary from your generation. Um, I think in so many ways, it's not that we've run out of ideas. Just some of us are just exhausted. Yeah, it's been an endless cycle. I remember my little sister, uh, um, well, she's not too little. Well, she says, you know, this is the third time she's tried to vote for change. Third time to have that vote crushed and disappointed. Um, uh, she, had, she had met one of the ODM people and said, really, I'm just tired. I'm exhausted. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Your question, Chair. I think Yvonne has already mentioned that, yes, we need to, to elect people, but what kind of people? That's the question. And I said that because uh, most of the people who we have in Parliament, in fact, uh, the other day I was joking, uh, telling a friend of mine, he said, if I had power in Kenya, I would just abolish Parliament. Really? It's useless. And, and I would instead, for, for about maybe for 20 years, we'll have, we'll have a technocrats running the country and just get rid of these members, useless members of parliament. And instead use that money, billions of money, because as you know, our members of parliament, I think, are among the highest paid in the world. In fact, some of them are, are paid more than the, donor, the members of parliament in donor countries. We come here and beg, and your members of parliament, the, the, the salaries they, they receive is lower than what our members of parliament. So I would have just abolished that, because it's just useless. Anyway, since we do elect them, then let, let us at least elect people who we know will work for, for Kenya and for, for, for Kenyans. Most, in our elections, as we know, most, most we, we elect people who perhaps we elect somebody because he comes from my tribe, or somebody who has paid more money. People sell their votes, as you know. People will be given just 100 shillings, and you sell your five years of your life for 100 shillings by voting for that person, whom you, that person has proved that he's hopeless, he's useless, and still people vote them in for either tri tri for, for tribal reasons or for, 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 for monetary reasons and things like This is what I was saying. Okay, let's, let's elect people, but let's elect the right people. And partly, partly it's because maybe people keep on repeating that mistake. Maybe there is a need to have political education in Kenya. It seems as if people are not politically 
educated. So it's not a question of not, not, vo not, not uh, voting people at all or not electing people at all, but electing the right people. This is what I meant by that. Coming to the social media, yes, I've, I've seen that in social media because I, I do read almost all the Kenyan paper every day, every Kenyan papers in the, in the internet. And I see the, I, um, what interests me more is what the people, uh, people's reaction to, to those stories. It's very good, but it should not end there. The problem with that is that many people think that once one has written something there, that's it, it's finished, his job is finished. Yes. These people, I mean, they don't care what you say about them. Say whatever you want, but they will continue to do what they want. It's important to comment, to give these reactions, but at the same time, those words have to be followed by action. And it's, uh, the problem with, that, with, 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 with writing in the internet and these social media, it's that those people never meet. People, they're, they're, they're from different parts of it. Some of them may be in the, in the diaspora. There is a need to, for people to sit down together and discuss things. And you know, again, if I, if I give you the experience of, of our activities, I told you about this uh, first um, committee which we formed in London, Committee for the Release of Political Prisoners. We worked together for five years. And while we were working in those five years, we were studying each other. Because you cannot just rise up and say, okay, let's form a political movement. You don't know the people whom you're working with. We scrutinized each other. And I remember we started with about 14 people. We ended up with only seven of us. <laughs> After I said, ah, these now, seven of us, we can work together. Then we, because we had trusted each other. We tested each other different, in different ways. Now, you cannot just by commenting on the internet and things that uh, things will change. People need to really to to sit down and discuss things and come out with, uh, with solutions on what to be done, which you cannot do by, in the in, in, in internet, yes, you can. Again, how many people have access to that? The real people who matter, the people in the villages. I don't know how widespread it is. Excuse me, uh, we've got the highest, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what is it called? Penetration to my mom, okay. Uh, right, but still. That's, that's, that, that by itself is not enough. Really, you need to organize. organize, really organize and organize. I would like to close this with a reading by Yvonne, so, but I would take if there's really an urgent, urgent question. Yes. One. Uh, thank you. Uh, please, ke please keep it short. Yeah, my, my name is Msumba, and I'm very uh, very grateful to meet uh, Professor again and uh, Yvonne. Um, my question is on the role of the writers, and there are writers here, on uh, all these things. Uh, because uh, as uh, Amzi Abdallah told us, Vengogi uh, Watyongo would give us the history and uh, fight uh, the administration from a different direction. And now we, uh, the new writer like Yvonne cannot uh, do it uh, the Ngugi way. With all this, the government running on propaganda, on lies, in a situation where uh, someone brings a, uh, a hyena and tells us that this is a god. And now, how do we, uh, how can you successfully and effectively write in such an atmosphere or must a writer now also be a blogger at the same time? Yeah, she said I should be short. Uh, like, I have several questions, but okay. okay. Thank you for this question. And the very final one in the back? Very final, yeah. Uh, I have a question to uh, Mr. Abdallah, if it would be possible, if there's time to listen to one of the poems in your family tome. In the end. Oh, All right. <laughs> <laughs>
I think in some ways your reading itself will answer almost the question that the gentleman has asked. Uh, uh, do do what you need to do, uh, write blog or whatever. I, I think that's the challenge of, of this particular new century. And uh, the nature of art is to find a way to uh, to sneak away uh, of expression. You will, there is always a way of expression. Um, the role of the writer remains the same one. It has always been, I guess. Um, the writer as an artist, certainly in, in my case, I'm not a non-fiction writer. Uh, as witness, as a reluctant prophet, perhaps, as uh, somebody who wants to, uh, somebody who who uh, wants to wallow in delusion, <laughs> um, perhaps, um, to ask the questions, and ultimately, at the core of most uh, artistic questions is that um, eternal question: what What does it actually mean to be human? Uh, not in a generic way. In my particular case, it would be: What does it mean to be human in Kenya? Um, and, and, you know, and I guess there are very many ways of, of, of writing, of expressing. Uh, and uh, in terms of text, I include uh, music, art, visual arts, um, and even maps. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll read uh, from uh, uh, the section where the, uh, the, the, the father character, Nupir, is uh, on a plane taking his dead son home, um, his daughter's with him. So a lot of the memories now come, the memories that he has suppressed come flooding in. Today, the past, the past's beckon is persistent. From the air, Nye peer, peers down at an expanding abyss. His country, his home, is ripping itself apart. Stillborn ba ballot revolution. These 2007 elections were supposed to be simple. The next small jump into a light-filled Kenyan future. Everything had instead disintegrated into a single and ending howl by the nation's unrequited dead. This country, this haunted ideal, all its poor, broken promises. Nipir watches armpits damp, a view of, of ground-lit smoke, dry lips. His people had never set their nation on fire before. On the ground that night in a furtive ceremony, beneath a half moon, a chubby man will mutter an oath that will render him the president of a burning, dying country. The deed will add fuel to an already out of control national grieving. Nipir turns from the window. He is flying home with his children, yet he is alone. Memories are solitary ghosts. He lets them in, traveling with them. Down country, December 12th, 1963. Linguess a soldier hoisted a red, black, green, and white flag up in a park. The flag collected sparks and visions drifting like clouds. In that arena of spectacle, Nipiro Ganda had led a cavalcade lug lugging a smaller red, black, brown, and white flag while riding on a high-stepping black horse. He had shrieked as if expelling a fiend. Eyes left! Clip-clop, clip-clop, hooves and blurring vision, men on a podium, some who he thought had died. Two men he knew had pounded other men to death. Another had been detained for his own safety and been supplied with a stream of world literature and unlovely comfort women. One of them he married. He had focused on one man, Tom Joseph Mboya, who had colored in the red, green, white, and black flag he had years before scoured the landscape and found promising souls that he sent to America to study, experience, and then come back home with transcendent dreams. The leader of the nation had tilted his head at the tracker policeman carrying the Kenya flag, a dark man on a black horse. In his sweaty palms, the flag had almost slipped as Nupir had bellowed, eyes front. 
A mosaic people had cheered, wanderers, cattlemen, camel herders, fishermen and hunters, dreamers, strangers, gatherers and farmers, trading nations, empire builders, and the forgetful. Such were the people for whom Nyapir had carried the new Kenya flag. There was also the anthem created from a Pokomo mother's lullaby. O God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. Blended cultures, intoxicating fusion. The new revised Kenya. Bead kofir on his head, cloaked, fly whisk flicking. The leader spoke. His voice was a bass drum. Glory, goodness, forgiveness, education. Work hard. Nyepir had tended the firelit euphoria inside his body. Harambe! A nation brought to task in a clarion call that had hauled steel across the land and built a railway. The national summons, response, a howled, eh! Hey! But then came the fear. It split words into smaller and smaller fragments until words became secret, suffocating, and silent. No one cried when the voracious, frenzied seizing of lives began. A new word sli slithered into the landscape. Nyakua. Plunder, possess. Entitled brigandage. It was cleansed to mean hard work. In the nation, slow horror, as if all had woken up to a vision of violating, crowing goals, crowding their beds. Nyepir remembers how bodies started to stoop to contain the shame, the loss, the eclipse. Such eyes turned inward silence, in, such eyes turned inward silences, so that when bodies started showing up mutilated and truly dead, the loudest protests were created out of whispers. To protect new post-independence citizen children, like most new Kenya parents denying soul betrayals, Nyepir built illusions of another Kenya, shouting out the words of the national anthem when he could, as if the volume alone would remove the rust eating into national hopes. Keeping mouths, ears, and eyes shut, parents had petitioned sorrow, purchased even more silence, and promised a better future. Plane drone, slight turbulence, they bounce. Better future. It's a groan in Nyepir's head. He rubs its tautness. His daughter is staring through the plane's window. Below, more greenhouses, flower farms, Aldonio Kerry, Mount Kenya, a sentinel. That is a revelation. Nyepir shouts, the mountain. The pilot looks back. My son, uh, he likes Nyepir vo Nyepir's voice cracks. The pilot scans the horizon and swings, swings the plane right to circumnavigate Mount Kenya. Batian, Lenana, Makalda, he intones. The late afternoon sun has colored the sparse snow's crimson. His daughter squashes her face against the window pane and feels the northward swing in her body. Soon, the flamingos appear on oyster shell colored water next to the milk blue Annam Kaala Kol, Lake Turkana. The pilot says, there's Lake Lugipi. They know this is their territory. Telek is volcano, a brown bowl, windy landforms. They pass over Loyangalani towards Mount Kulal, shift northeast towards Kalachagoda. They level over the salt flats fringing the Chalbi Desert. Huri Hills in the dusk light, and then below, a wide and kempt stripe carved into the land. The plane flies through the layers of time, reveals the hollowed brown rocks below, where his children would survey the rustling mar march of desert locusts. Dry, gold-brown pastures where livestock browse, and they would run after homemade kites. Eat cactus berries and curse one of the land's visiting winds, which had ripped the kites to shreds. They had reached Wothogik. They had reached home.
Thank you very much, Yvonne, Adiamo Wur, Abdelatif, Abdallah. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thanks all of you. Um, um, there was a request. Um, do you have a text with you? Do you? Are we still fresh? Yes. Yes. Of course. Of course. Let's let's close with the short one. Yeah. <clears throat> When I was invited here, we were, I was told that we are, we are coming to talk. <laughs> so this reading uh, bit, I think it was uh, last minute uh, uh, thing when we were told that our people are expecting that. So <laughs> therefore I didn't come with my <laughs> poems. Anyway, I'll, the lady there said wanted to hear a poem in Kiswahili. Now, there's one poem in this collection of uh, poems which I wrote in prison uh, and I wrote these poems on toilet paper because I was not allowed any reading or reading material, writing or reading material in this solitary confinement I had. But uh, I used the toilet paper and one of the warders who were uh, my permanent guards, I had befriended him and uh, I had asked him for a pencil and he brought me, he smuggled in a small piece of pencil which I used to write this. Um, now, one of the poems which are in there, and I say that if I had only written that poem, just that one poem would have been sufficient for me. Uh, this poem is called Siwati. <clears throat> Siwati, it means I will never abandon, meaning my conviction, uh, despite the hardships. I was going through there. Um, now, this poem was first was to to assure, reassure my elder brother, this brother of mine who put me into all these things, this political thing, that I will never abandon my conviction. And this is partly because when I was writing those pamphlets, because Kenya Trindapi was the seventh pamphlet, I used to write them every month. Uh, I managed to to evade arrest in those six ones, they didn't know who it was. But the last one, Ken Shendapi, I was betrayed by one of my, 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 my comrades, uh, who, was, who became the star, the main prosecution witness in my trial. Now, when I was writing those pamphlets, especially the last one, my, this elder brother of mine told me that this pamphlet is going to land you into problems. You must tone down the language in this pump. But I refused. I said, no. So what he did, he was asking me, are you sure you want to, to this language to remain as it is? I said, yes. Because he told me this time they're going to arrest you. Are you prepared for that? I said, well, I said, yes, I'm prepared for that. Because the worst, the worst if I'm lucky, they will arrest me. If the worst comes to the worst, they will kill me. I said, are you prepared for all that? I said, yes, I'm prepared for that. So he gave me an advice, said, if you are prepared for all that and you believe that once they arrest you and put you into trouble, you won't surrender or give up your conviction, okay, you have my blessing, go. But if you have a small doubt in your heart that once they start arresting you, you'll abandon your conviction, then better abandon it now. So when in prison, I was, I could not send this poem to him because I wasn't allowed any letters, send letters, or even family was not allowed to visit me. So I wrote this poem. Uh, unfortunately, you won't have the translation. But the gist of it is that I'm saying that despite the hardship, despite the hardship I'm going through here in prison, I will never abandon my conviction. And even if I am released, I'll continue with the struggle. Siwati nshishielo, siwati. Kwani ni wate? Siwati ni nilo hilo talishika kwa vivyote? Siwati. Ni miminalo hapano au popote, hadi kaburini sote miminalo tufukiwe. Siwati ngaadhibiwa adhabu kila mifano. Siwati ni ngaambiwa tapawa kila kinono. Siwati lilosawa. Silibandui mkono. Hata ninga umuameno mkono si ubandui. Siwati, si ushindani muka sema na shindana. Siwati, fahamuni sababu ya waungwana. Siwati, ndangu imani, 
ni thaminio sana na kuiwata naona itakuwa ni mwahali. Siwati nimeradhiwa kufikwa na kila mawi, siwati ningaambiwa niaminio hayawi, siwati ni, kisha nikawa kama nzi hivyo siwi thamma na kariri siwi na Mungu nisaidia. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Please join us outside for a drink, a little bite to eat. Inside? Okay, it will be outside on the right. Um, thanks so much for coming. Thanks again to the two of you. Have a safe journey home.